going to disobey you. I know. Well, while you're doing that. Yes. Uh, if you haven't picked up your envelopes, they're here. Pick them up. No, they're outside the door. Well, that's true. <laughs> yes. And fill them full. Fill them. One at a time. Big There's an article I read earlier, and I wanted to just share it with you. It's entitled, Study People Less Afraid of Death Are Atheist or Very Religious. It says, atheists and the very religious people are the least afraid of death, according to a new study. The study found fear of death was correlated with, the, with religious, religiosity in an inverse U pattern, meaning moderately religious people are the most afraid of death. No comfort, no assurance of anything. Higher levels of rel religiosity are linked to a lower level of death anxiety, but so having no religion is having no religion whatsoever. Quote, this definitely complicates the old view that religious people are less afraid of death than non-religious people, uh, Dr. Jonathan Jong, researcher at Coventry University. It may well be that atheism also provides comfort from death or that people who are just not afraid of death aren't compelled to seek religion. Researchers looked at 100 studies and surveys of religious belief covering 26,000 people worldwide. Most of these studies were conducted in the United States among Christians, but a few were conducted in the Middle East, uh, East Asia on Muslims. Uh, this makes it hard to generalize how religiosity in different religions relates to anxiety about death. The study found that the pattern to be remarkably consistent no matter how they measured religious belief, including surveying the belief in God, the belief in the afterlife, or just religious behavior about going to church or praying. So if you're just a, a middle of the road uh, believer, then you're afraid of death, basically. Yeah, yeah, in the end, in the end, you know, um, like the quote I read this morning, uh, uh, at the time of death, you don't see yourself. You s you're facing God. And so that happens. Let's just pause for, for prayer, please. Tonight, Father, we gather here again in this place and are mindful of the brevity of this life, that uh, we too are like the flowers of the field. Uh, soon we fade and uh, wither and uh, the dust is we blow away with. Um, and so may our life be one of profit for, with you. Uh, for this world, what it offers in its allurements, in its temporal beauty, has nothing whatsoever to compare to the glories of heaven. Tonight, Lord, we sang of your praise, of your constant comfort and care for your children here on this earth, but also of the great hope that we have in the world that lies hereafter, one upon which we may see those who have gone on before, uh, the great cloud of witnesses, uh, loved ones that we have known who are in Christ um, and looking for our Savior especially, for we know we shall see him face to face. And yet, Lord, we are surrounded with people who are bound within the system of this world leaning on their own religion, their own good works, their own philosophies. And yet, Lord, they too one day will die. And without Christ, we are assured, we have the absolute confidence that they will spend eternity in hell. Oh God, burden our hearts, irrespective of their age, of their, uh, their background, their, their status in life, burden our hearts for those that you put in our path in order that we might be ones who would lighten the path to them, that we would sow the seed, the good seed, then in your spirit may take it and fall upon good soil to produce a bountiful harvest. We're mindful, Father, that someone at one day in the past had prayed for us. Uh, someone in the past, uh, a family member or church folks or Sunday school people prayed for our salvation and, and the fruit is evident in us coming to know you. So Lord, may we pray, may we witness, may we recognize the, the great joy that we have in leading somebody to you 
uh, as Lord and Savior and uh, indeed facing not a question about the hereafter but a certainty and assurance that once they leave this earth they will be with you in glory. Thank you again for our Lord's Day. Thank you again for the privilege we have of meeting here. And Father, as we open your word, uh, we, we are confident that it can provide and does provide with, with, our, with our lives as individuals and as couples and as a community and as a nation. It provides us with truth. It provides us with that which was profitable for those who lived in times uh, of the scriptures and has been profitable to the lives of those since then. Uh, we hear their testimonies and we are our own examples ourselves. So tonight, Father, quiet our hearts and, and instill in us the, uh, the truth that lies within your word, that it can strengthen us, it can lead us, it can convict us, it can provide that which we, we so desperately need in our day. Uh, bless our time around it, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you open your Bibles, uh, no surprise, uh, Proverbs. And I'd ask us together to read Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. These few verses, I included this in our reading this morning. And as Mr. McCoy alluded to, he hit the nail on the head is where we're going. Proverbs 6, sixteen to 19. Let's read together. These six things hath the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. May God be pleased to bless our reading and hearing of his word this evening. Our second portion of this uh, service here tonight, looking at Solomon's powerful proclamations of the seven things that God hates and finds them as an abomination to him. Seven things that we should avoid, not practice, keep away from. Seven things that we could safely say, if God hates it, so should I. And I'll tell you, after this morning, uh, and you know, I've, I'm familiarized myself with these and I know in my head, but I was mindful of the pride part all the way home and all the way through. The, it just kept coming up. It kind of pokes me. It's kind of like the idiot light that comes on the dashboard, you know, something's wrong here. And so we tr pray that not only these things, but all of God's word would be profitable in such a way as a warning in keeping us on the right path. We deal with lying tonight. And as we think about it, it has lots of names. It's a big family. Falsehoods, fibs, perjury, myth, stories inventions, half-truths, and so forth. All kinds of names it's covered under. We promise to do something, and we don't have the slightest intention of doing it. I promise, really. But in the back of my mind, no, I'm not. I'm just kind of keeping things going. We spread a rumor about somebody, knowing full well that what I said was not true. I didn't do my homework. I just found this to be a a tasty tidbit that I ought to throw out in order to smear somebody's reputation. A phone call comes in for you, and you tell whoever ever answering the phone, I'm not here. I'm not here. You know, All different ways that happens. We face lies daily in the newspaper reports. The athlete telling, I never use steroids, and he is a mountain of a guy, you know? Never! You know, he's outperforming everybody. Some president of a West African company saying, I have never personally pocketed money that has been given to my country. It has never benefited me one bit. And the little boy with the chocolate all over his face, I didn't eat any of my candy. No. And it's all around him like that. Various levels of falsehoods 
and we kind of become just accustomed to it as part of the life that we live. We lie to our spouses. I've always been faithful to you, sweetie. I have. Okay. We lie to the IRS. I only made 35000 We lie to Grandma. Thank you for that sweater you bought me, Grandma. It is really lovely. We lie to our children. Yes, there is a Santa Claus and an Easter Bunny. In court, we have to put our hand on the Bible and swear that we will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And just in case there is a serum that we can be injected to or a machine that we can be hooked up to to tell whether I'm lying or not. USA Today found that only 56% of Americans teach honesty to their children. Half the people only teach honesty to their children. Lou Harris poll found that 65% of high school students would cheat on an important exam. They would do it. One third of adults, 32%, claimed that the way things are these days, lying is something necessary. And we think of all the situations that we find ourselves in, and it becomes a way of life. Everybody does it, one form or another. After doing 3.8 million background checks, the Automatic Data Processing Incorporated announced 52% of job applicants lied on their resumes. 52% of those who filled out resumes lied on them. I want to show that I am qualified. I want to show that I did this or that I didn't do this or whatever. I want the promotion. In a book, the day America told the truth. It says 91% of those surveyed lied routinely about matters they considered trivial. There's the key. This is an important issue. It's a trivial matter, so it's easy to lie about it. 36% lied about important matters. 86% lied regularly to their parents. 75% lied regularly to friends, 74% to their siblings, and 69% to their spouses. Huge numbers, huge numbers. It becomes epidemic. I think those last figures were rather revealing, probably more than any other organ of the body, the tongue, our speech, our words, are a window to our soul. And if you find a product that's being sold and, and you know the guy's lying to you, you know the salesman's pulling it over, what do you think of him? What do you think of the product he's selling? What do you think of the whole industry that goes on like that? And, and it just is compounded. Pride, as we saw this morning, is sourced in the soul and usually displayed, but not always to be seen. Can't always tell that a person's pride has become uh, part of the controlling factor of his life. But contrary to that lying, which is also sourced in man's heart, is visible at all time, but it can be clear to the soul than I think anything else. You can tell somebody's heart attitude, their whole demeanor, by finding out that was indeed a lie. Now the beginning of the problem of this lying is twofold. The first, that we were born with the inclination to sin, and in this case, the inclination to lie. And secondly, it is often the path of least resistance. In other words, lying, indeed, is an easy thing to do. It's part of my nature, and that's not an excuse. And we also find that lying becomes something that's easy to do. We look at Jesus' comment in John 8, 44. He says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. If there is one comment, description of Satan, that Jesus puts upon him, it's this matter of 
the falsehoods, the lies that are presented. Regular part of him. It was a lie that ensnared our first parents when Eve and then Adam believed and acted upon that lie the serpent offered them. Scripture says, Now the serpent said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did he really say that? Obviously he knew. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He takes that which was truth and conveniently works it in in order that his, that his whole deceptive process can be proven false. It continues after Cain kills his brother Abel openly and he denies, he lies about it, and then he's guilty of anything. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is thy brother? And he said unto him, I don't know. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And it continues on from the parents all the way through this practice of lying. I think it's important for us to have learned that after generation and generation after generation, the, the, the working of lying is perfected. It's proven as each generation goes on. From our earliest days, we learn by trial and error, and we can really become experts at lying. So it is born within us. It is our sinful nature. And we can't sit and say, well, this is my reason for doing it. It's because my first parents did it, and I saw my mother and my father and my parents showed it to me as something that was a proper thing to do, and it was popular in school and so forth. But it is also the matter of being a path of least resistance. In other words, easy to do. And I think most of the time we're never caught at the lie, or it's not that big of an issue in our lives. Abraham lies to Pharaoh and later lies to Abimelech with the same lie about his sister. No, Sarah, his wife. The same thing. Well, it somewhat worked. It helped out this way, and, and I can go ahead and do it again. Abraham did not believe that God would or God could protect him. So he had to provide a lie in order to compensate for that which he never even thought of that God would do for him protecting Sarah. Joseph's brothers lying to their father about Joseph. They used the lie to cover up their hatred in the attempted murder of this beloved brother. He died, he was torn by animals. Here's the, here's the coat ripped to shreds and blood all over it. Indeed, and the more lies that they surround themselves with, the easier it became and so it is with us. You can almost convince yourself that this lie has become the truth. And I think after so many years, that built upon them. Potiphar's wife, lying to her husband about Joseph. It was a cover-up of the sinful lust that she had with, uh, within her own heart for Joseph. And in order to protect herself, she has to lie to her husband about what Joseph was and what he had tried to do and how innocent she was in the matter. Peter, at the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ in the courtyard, accused, yet he lies, he denies three times. Aren't you with, aren't you one of, isn't this part of, no, no, no. It was convenient, it was easy to do. What was he going to do? Say, oh yeah, I was, oh man, I'm, I can get arrested, I can, this, this can happen to me, and this can happen to me. To cover up Peter's shame and fear, his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, lying was convenient. Ananias and Sapphira lied to Peter. Actually, they lied to the Holy Spirit about the property that they had and that they sold for such and such an amount and then come around and say, here's the money. And it was a lie. And they lost their lives. It covered up their personal greed. 
This morning I mentioned God removing King Saul because he failed to obey God in the slaying of the Amalekites because his pride stood in the way. Scripture says, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel says, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them. In other words, the other people, not me. It's not my responsibility. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Saul's being captured in the lie, builds the lie even greater, stands off and blames somebody else, and then puts himself on the side. He says, well, we did the right thing, but they, but they were at fault. Saul's disobedience was one thing, but the lie, in essence, his lie to God totally destroyed what was ever left in that relationship. It continued to build as time went on. A number of years ago, a pastor that I was familiar with and had even been in his church, um, one of his elders said, something's not right with this man. We're just, you know, he was an excellent preacher. Everybody loved his, his oratory. Um, he was uh, probably in his middle 30s or so, uh, spoke about the number of doctoral degrees he had. Uh, his wife had been killed. Um, everybody just, you know, just adored this man. But the one elder says, something's not right. So he did a little bit of searching and found out that his wife hadn't died, that she was still alive, living in another state. And the further searching that he does, come to find out he had no doctor degrees. He had one associate's degree. He was a brilliant man. So we brought him before the presbytery and and the charges were opened up before and and he readily confessed he says my father was a perfectionist and when i couldn't meet the demands of my father i had to lie and i had to lie and everything lie after lie after lie after lie i think and and he learned he was a brilliant man because he could learn things without the degrees and yet his whole life was clouded in a lie. It was easy to do for him because his whole life was a lie. So we said, well, we'll temporarily remove you from uh, uh, preaching and uh, found a place for him in another state to go for counseling and, and so forth. And he says, I'll do that. That too was a lie. He disappeared. Don't know what happened to him. Uh, his marriage, his degrees, his previous ministries, all compounding one with the other. In this man's case, he exhibited the real danger of lying. He so believed the lie that it was natural for him, almost to the point of believing it himself. Dr. James Dobson said, If you tell me the truth all the time, I can believe you all the time. If you tell me the truth part of the time, I can't believe you any of the time. The pit becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. These six things doth the Lord hate, and even seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue. It's serious stuff. It's serious. What's the ninth commandment? I hear mumbling. Thank you. I was going to offer some money there, but you know, glad you got it. That was a lie. I'll accept my money. Well, yes, yeah. <laughs> what does the commandment basically mean? Basically, don't lie. Yet there's always the positive side to it. In the catechism, shorter catechism number 77, it says, what is required in the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment requireth the maintaining and the promoting of truth between man and man and our own and our neighbor's good name, especially in the witness bearing. 
the promoting and preserving of truth between yourself and your neighbor. Obviously, who's your neighbor? We understand that part of it. It includes speaking up for the truth when everybody else is silent. It is just not saying, I'm not going to lie, but it's promoting truth, living truth, making it as part of the way we live. So what do we say about lying? What happens when it occurs? First of all, I think the point is that we need to love the truth. And this is a heart change. The young man that we knew, he had to have a change of heart to say, this is sinful. My lifestyle of, of lying is wrong. And it has to change. But it has to change from within the heart. David spoke of the truth in the inward parts. You see, a person is not a liar because he tells lies. A person indeed is a liar because he is a liar from the inside. Mark Twain said, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Court cases, you know, it's, that's a key to that. Uh, every good lawyer would be able to find out the contradictions in the testimony of a liar. So it's simply best to tell the truth at all times. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 2, And then shall the wicked be rewarded, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him who's coming after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the the, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Love the truth. Loving the truth. We, we, we love God's word because here is truth. We love God because he is truth. But truth ought to be that which we love in our life. It ought to be synonymous with who we are in telling it and in living it. Much of our world despises the truth of God and his word in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that despising of the truth makes them prime candidates for the lies of Satan and Antichrist. So, first of all, love the truth. Secondly, learn the truth. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, Think on these things. Meditate on these things. Our world is filled with so many of the avenues of lying. Every sensory perception, every gate, the eye gate, the ear gate, the nose gate, it's all built upon a, a false leaning in, in what is right and what is wrong. We are constantly being informed of the flowing of a multitude of sources. What's good? Is it all truth? Is it all acceptable? We need to learn the truth. Saturate our minds and our hearts with things like the word of God, for the truth sets us free. It's how Jesus defeated Satan in the wilderness. Satan offers him these, these things as being truth, and Jesus says, no, the word says this. This is truth as compared to that, and it stops Satan right in his tracks. Knowing the truth, learning it, and having it as a part of our life. Thirdly, living the truth. Paul says, Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one with another. Be accountable to others. If we see that our telling the truth is the bond of Christian society, then we need to hold each other accountable in such matters. When we speak, it represents what is in our hearts the truth of the gospel, as well as all that God has written in his revelation, it remains true. If I promote myself and say, I am a Christian and this is what I believe and these are the truths that I hold true, then my life ought to exhibit truth in every way possible. Live the truth. Be open to others stopping you when gossip and slander comes in. We're sitting around, we're having a good time, and all of a sudden we start to talk about things that really isn't truth, isn't found in building people up, defending a brother's name. 
if somebody says, hey, you know, we really shouldn't be talking like that, do we go, who are you, you know? You should listen to Pastor's sermon on pride, you know, something like that, you know. Can I be stopped? Can I come to somebody and say, hey, listen, these are things that we should not be talking about. We talk about living the truth. Uh, Volkswagen lost millions of dollars when they knew their diesel engines were, were, were wrong, putting out uh, wrong information, and they continued to do it. And then all the way up the line, it's, well, who knew it? Who knew it? Who knew it? Well, to protect their good name, to try and cover up. Lie built upon lie. There was no living the truth there. Headlines right here in Philadelphia. Describing himself as merely a thankful beggar, Philadelphia District Attorney Seth Williams sought thousands of dollars in bribes from deep, deep pocketed donors seeking to help his legal he seeking to help their legal woes. Federal authorities said Tuesday as they unveil a 23 count indictment charging the two term Democrat in a sprawling corruption case. Seth Williams, among many politicians who come along and says they're caught with their, in essence, caught in a lie. And, and, and year after year after year, they go, well, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I'm here for the people and all and such. Living the truth. And the man is just an absolute shame. Let me ask you, what percent of the convicted criminals come along and say, yes, I did the crime? How many of you are entering into the jail and, and so forth say, well, I really, I didn't do it. I'm innocent of this. You know, Well, the same with us, what we say and what we do. So when we find ourselves that we've stepped over the line, when your words do not reflect the truth, when your actions are deceptive, and what you have to say or are saying will say, twist the truth so that you can gain some advantage, what do you do? First of all, confess it. We stop right there and say, Lord, I've done this. Immediately correct it and immediately commit yourself to the truth. You know, I'd, I'd love to have somebody say, you know, what I told you wasn't right. What I was trying to lead here, I'm sorry for what I did. And boy, the respect that we'd have for somebody who would do that is, is tremendous. So as we, as God's children, we come to this thing and God hates it because we represent him in truth and telling things as truth. Guard what's on our lips. It comes from our hearts. Be mindful that we are to live and to love and to, to promote those things that, in essence, are who we are as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all truth, and that's what we promote. Let's pray. And Father, we're thankful that your word is here to us as truth. The hard part, Lord, and we readily confess it's, it's applying it weak vessels that we are we can't do it by ourselves so we humbly request that your spirit work in us to live the lives that we ought to be that our lips would uh, bring forth the praise that is due to your name and then when we find ourselves or when somebody brings us to the point of, of, of catching us and, and finding that we're not in such a truthful state that we'd readily accept it We'd make uh, the apologies necessary, confession to be done, and bring truth into our lives. The refreshment of such a lifestyle, uh, Lord, would bring uh, great testimony to yourself. Uh, thank you, Father, for walking with us through these uh, two pieces of your scripture, the matter of pride and the matter of, of speaking the truth. And we pray, Lord, that uh, as we understand how you hate it, uh, so indeed, uh, we ought to also, and in like manner, um, having humbled hearts and speaking the truth are things that you love. So, Father, may we love that also. Uh, bless, Father, as we uh, conclude our time together. Uh, we rejoice in the privilege of being your children and, and uh, knowing, Lord, that uh, your hand is upon us. Uh, as we are dismissed from this place, we pray that not only your grace and mercy, but your peace and love would be upon us, that you would take us to our homes in safety, and that, Lord, we might uh, find this coming week to be a, a week of great spiritual profit. Thank you once again for bringing us together. In Jesus' name.